it's been a it's been a nice week just you know thanksgiving it's been good to just relax spend time with family do you consider turkey to be kosher or not there's always an argument about that that's your um for for some time i believed it was not kosher but i pretty much decided upon that it's kosher until proven otherwise okay and yeah, I, one of the things was um, the fact that chickens uh, eat some gross stuff, but uh, like bugs and things like that. But apparently all kosher birds will sometimes eat bugs. So I don't know about that. Okay. I have another question for you real quick. Did I forget what it was? Yeah, I did. Well, um, you, you're not one of those that consider Thanksgiving a pagan holiday, are you? No. Um, I, I have a very different take on seeing what's pagan, what's not. You know, a lot of people who come into the movement of Hebrew roots uh, or trying to live a more Hebraic lifestyle, they have... Uh, this idea that everything's pagan. I'm very much the opposite of that. I embrace commonalities with paganism rather than shun away from them. So Okay. You're not one of those hardline conservatives, those hard shell people where everything is wrong and you can't do anything right? I'm glad to hear that. I'm a different type of that type of conservative. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Is everybody fine tonight? What do we got here? Three, four all together? Four of us all together. I think more will come on. I have some brand new questions. It seems like this week they just come flowing in. All about Thanksgiving, right? Well, I don't know. I really haven't looked at them, but here they are. Let's see. No. Oh, a whole bunch of them. Not one about Thanksgiving. Hmm. Okay. I could give, oh, look. I'm talking about maybe 20 questions came in on the 26th, 27th, 25th, 24th, 23rd. Each from a different person? Yeah. You want to see them? Sure, if you want. I'll just show you real quick. I, I'm not lying. Share screen or copy share, and paste? I'll share screen real quick. Here they are. Everything that says Quora on there is coming to me. Oh, it's on Quora. That's where you get the questions, huh? Yes, yeah, so I, I get the questions on Quora because I'm out there and I put uh, quite a few answers out there and now People. Wait, so so where where are you getting the like do you have like a thing that that like says ask me questions like how are people knowing to ask you questions? You put out or or is it just is it just like a recommendation thing like this is what questions people have? No, it's like if you answer a few questions and some people like your answers, uh they will contact you for their with their questions. Oh, okay. So I don't know why so many came in the last few days. It must have been something I put out there, but they ask you personally how you would answer the question. I don't have time for all that. You know, I like okay, so, so um, cl click one of them for a second. Show me. All right. Let's see. Let's look. Here's one. Just a simple question. Is the book of Baruch in the Bible? Now, these people that ask these questions have to choose you to answer. It's not like they just throw a question out there. They have to choose who they want to answer that. And if you can't answer it, you know, you can pass it on or you can write an answer right there from your, uh, from your email. Yeah. I thought these were people who were, like, going to the HOD website and submitting a... Uh... A question to oh, I do those too. There are some of those too. All right. Well, Not you can stop sharing. You can speaking. stop sharing the. Uh, if you want, you could just pick the questions you want to do. Sure. I don't need to see them all. 
How about you all? Anything to follow up on from the last time? Okay. Most, most of the people that were here last time are not here this time, I think. Well, you saw this particular question, and it's a good question. Is the book of Baruch in the Bible? It's kind of an on the edge kind of question. What do you think? Well, we've talked about this before. Of, uh, d different uh, canons have different books uh, that they include in the Bible, and most Bibles include Baruch as scripture. Uh, only very few don't. You know, the Protestants don't, and the Orthodox Jews, they don't. But otherwise, practically everybody else does. Is uh, Baruch, I know there's like three Baruchs. Is this Baruch that's in the Bible the same as the letter of Jeremiah? Are they the yeah. same, or are they different, or do you know? No, um, so the letter of Jeremiah is like the... In Catholic Bibles, Letter of Jeremiah is the sixth chapter of the Book of Baruch. Um, whereas in other Bibles, they're completely different books. Yeah, I see it sometimes all alone. I didn't compare them. So actually, the Letter of Baruch, which was, of course, supposedly copied by Baruch from Jeremiah, is also within the canonical Book of Baruch. And that would be one, two, and three, Baruch. I think the third one is an apocalypse, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. They, they, call, they call the second one an apocalypse as well. All right. Good job. Good job. Let's go back. Hmm. Oh, here's one on. Uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought that was one coming in. What do the 12 stars around Mary's head mean? That's not strictly biblical, but I guess it could be maybe Revelation. I don't, yeah, Revelation talks about the woman awaiting the birth of a son. Revelation 12. What do you think? To me, there's only really two possibilities. Either the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 apostles. There's really no other answer. Exactly. And both of those answers are used in the interpretation by most of the uh, scholars that look into that. Uh, what is special about Henoch, the father of Methuselah? That has, that's a big question. You could be talking about that all day. I'm sure you're prepared for that one. Enoch. Yeah. Or Henoch. Henoch. Yeah, there's different ways to say it. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you answer that? Oh, I think the most special thing about Enoch is, as I mentioned a couple times before, that there's a section there, the so-called parables, that um, describe the identity of the Son of Man. And there's one, oh, here's somebody waiting to come in. There's one verse there that actually tells what the name of the Son of Man is. It says the name of the Son of Man is Enoch, but it's an interpolation. So in that whole section, it doesn't specifically say who the Son of Man is, but if it's coming from Enoch, well, he's describing maybe himself, but probably someone else. Another thing I think that's interesting in the book of Enoch that we talked about, I think, last week was the story from Genesis 6 that's either expanded in Enoch at the beginning of Enoch, or Genesis is a de-expansion on that with a giants, Nephilim, Giborim, and uh, one of the chapters there late. No, this came up, this came up, I think, in last week's message. Uh, it said, they are said to be the offspring between these Nephilim and women are said to be 3,000 elves. 
I saw you making a comment about that yeah, on uh, Laura's uh, post. Yeah, I checked that out, uh, an L's a cubit. That would be nearly a mile high. I mean, that's... that's well, cer certainly does not use the word L in Ethiopian, as far as I understand. It probably uses some other word, yeah, which they, they translate as L. Um, but there's different possibilities of that corruption. It could be 3,000 of a smaller unit of measurement. It could be 3,000 nails. I also noticed that the, the word L comes from Latin, not Ethiopic. And it's right. one of the one of the words that comes out of the word ulna, that bone in your arm. I would like to go look that up again in uh, in the Charles commentary uh, and see what that word actually is. Because that seems just utterly ridiculous that giants are nearly a mile high. We would certainly find some bones of that. Maybe they just considered those to be dinosaurs. I don't know. So uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, Damascus document, I believe it is. Um, it talks about cedar trees as well as mount mountains. Like it basically says the, uh, the giants were as as tall as cedar trees and as big as mountains. But the word for mountains can all, it, it doesn't always mean like humongous mountains. It can mean small hills. Yeah, um, right, hills. So, Fina. so the, way I, the way I see it is, so some, some uh, cedar trees, like if you go to a cedar tree, because it literally says it's as tall as cedar trees. So you look, okay, how tall are cedar trees? I think it said something like cedar trees can be up to 150 feet tall, but they typically are much shorter than that. Um, you're looking at something around 50 feet. Uh, so I think giants being 50 feet tall would be more believable. It might, it's, it might still be hard to believe, but it's certainly more plausible than 3,000 feet or whatever. You know? Yeah, are you familiar with the 30-foot footstep? 30 foot long footsteps and found in Israel not too long ago? No. Okay, They're, they found an old ruins of a temple. And th this is, I can't tell you exactly what happened, but they found coming up to that temple footprints that they don't think are man made, that are 30 feet in length walking up to this temple ruins. I have to look that up again. That's pretty interesting. What if they were a real footprint? That would tell us something. Does it look like a human footprint or just yeah, a footprint? Yeah, uh, uh, like a uh, barefoot with toes and everything, like Sasquatch. But how big is it again? 30 feet long. The, the footprint is 30 feet long? Yeah. Doesn't make I don't, I don't buy it personally. Okay. I, I'll look it up again. In, in the no, I mean I'm saying I don't believe it's a footprint of a big giant. I would find that hard to believe personally. It's got a footprint and then it's got five toes and there are several of these walking left and right up. You just got to keep in mind that that Goliath's height changes radically in the manuscripts of the Bible. You got the Masoretic text which has six and a half cubits tall Goliath. So that's like practically nine feet something tall, which is not super giant because we have, we've had people who have been that tall. Um, actual people confirmed. Uh, the, the one guy, uh, the, the, record, the record holder for the, the confirmed tallest man was eight feet, 11 inches. And according to the scientists, there was no indication he would have stopped growing Every indication was that he was going to keep getting taller and taller. So they definitely could have been as tall as nine feet. Um, but but uh, beyond that seems unlikely. Okay. I'll put a link to that archaeological site at Andara. Uh, I didn't read it, though. I wanted to hear what you had to say on that in case anybody wants to look at that. 
Let's see. I'm going to look it up. You want to question post? here? Well, yeah. okay. I got a question here that is uh, referring straight to apocryphal literature. We could do next if you'd like. Okay. Um, it says massive footprints were carved into the floor. That's what they say. Okay. Whether of giants, humans, or animals is debatable. So apparently the footprints, it's not clear whether the footprints are the appearance of animal footprints or human ones. Um, let's see. Here's the picture. Oh, wait. Yeah, that, that does look like uh, human footprints. Um, let's see. Wait, no, you said... This is the wall, and this is the footprint, supposedly. One of them. No, okay, so there's a mis misunderstanding here. Um, so, or at least you mis misstated it, or I misunderstood what you were saying. So it's not saying the footprint is 30 feet. It's saying um, the footprints are 30 feet apart from something else. No, is it? Yeah, it says... Um, the right footprint seen on the threshold is spaced at about 30 feet from the first footprint. Um, oh, so it's not a 30 foot footprint? No, it's a um, three foot, three inches in length. And it would, if, if it was human, it would be around 66 feet in height, which is actually close to what I said of the um, yeah. as, as tall as cedar tree type thing, 50 feet or something along those lines. That's kind of close to what I was saying. So that's interesting. Hmm. And what was the other one? It was uh, Devil's Tower in the comments was stated. I'm gonna just quickly look at that. Devil's Tower. Um, see here I don't know we I don't know which one oh, wait oh a tree the, the uh, on Wyoming there's a there's a map it says there's something in Montana um, so maybe it might be Montana I don't know I'm not sure about that one but let's move on okay next we have a question, as I mentioned before, that I would refer to apocryphal. How hey, Jackson, Jackson, let yeah. me just say um, about the question, though, of the tree thing. I, I don't believe the giants were like miles tall or whatever. Uh, like I said, I think at best you might have like a 50 feet tall. Um, what I was saying about Goliath in particular, the Masterbetic text says six and a half cubits, which would be about nine feet. Um, but Septuagint and Dead Sea Scrolls, and I think Josephus as well, say a lower number, four and a half cubits, which would mean Goliath was more about seven feet tall around. And um, yeah, seven it's, feet. it just seems unlikely that the scribes would change a higher height to a lower height in that type of way. They might change, like if, if it said, if it said, uh, 45 cubits, they might change it to four and a half cubits, but it doesn't seem likely that they would change uh, six and a half to four and a half. Um, it seems more likely that it might go in the opposite direction. Um, and then the other thing is, um, let's see. Oh, the Book of Jubilees talks about some of the giants being up, up to around 13 cubits, which would be close to 20 feet tall. Um, but like I said, uh, probably up to 50 feet, maybe beyond that would start to be getting ridiculous. The, the Ark of the, uh, not the Ark of the Covenant, but the Ark was only 450 feet uh, long and only like, what, 150 feet tall. So a giant being like a mile tall or whatever, or 450 feet tall, would would defy believability in that type of way. These are um, writers. They have a tendency to hyperbol, hyperbolize, hyperbolize, make things 
bigger, like oftentimes Josephus does the same thing with numbers. You take a number and maybe multiply it in order to show things bigger than they actually were. So I don't assign it to um, the Apocrypha writers themselves. I assign it more to uh, the, I, I assign it to the scribes who, scribes. who uh, later like redact someone else's work. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so, uh, okay. So sorry for interrupting the question. Um, go on, Jackson. How did the Christian population increase rapidly in Travancore? Travancore, I don't know what that is. Travancore is a religious center, a large city in India, central India. So I guess I'll answer that. Uh, it did increase very rapidly because according to the apocryphal literature, I think the Acts of Thomas, maybe, and the Acts of Thaddeus talk about Thomas or Thaddeus going down to India and establishing churches there. Quite an interesting story when Thaddeus is sold by Yahshua to an Indian guy in Israel trying to buy some carpenters to take back there. So Yahshua sells Thaddeus to this guy for two pieces of silver. And then he gives the silver to Thaddeus to help with his expenses. So there's a, that story also goes along with something written about Thomas. And so these churches expanded like crazy in the early centuries around Travancore. And down there, there is a place that is celebrated as the place of Thomas's martyrdom or Thaddeus, one of the two, I believe they took a spear during a, a sermon. And so that, um, that legend, or maybe fact, I feel like it's a fact of Thomas actually being in Travancore, took on, by this time, it's taken on huge amounts of tourists and converts and everything else. And I think that Travancore publicizes this to be a, an apostolic mission. So you'll see in India lots and lots and lots of churches dedicated to St. Thomas or St. Thaddeus or St. Mary as well uh, due to the stories, I believe, that are in the Acts of Thomas. Do you remember that, that story about Thomas going to the court of King uh, Prabha something and uh, the flute player, little flute player girl who spoke Hebrew and all that. Mm, yep. I think it's the Acts of Thomas. Yeah. Okay. That's that's it. Anything to add? Um, yeah. I basically, I think, um, see, one of the things that people say about the Bible, for example, is particularly in regards to the normal Protestant Bible, you hear people say the Bible must be true because just look at how the Bible has been preserved. They say something like there's more copies of the Bible preserved than any other book by far. But they do some very fishy, unfair um, numbers and statistics to skew the data and make it look like the Bible is amazingly preserved far better than everything else. Now, the Bible is preserved better than a lot of stuff, but not nearly as much as people try to say it is. So, for example, the Bible is basically 66 different books. I mean, unless you count uh, the way the Jews count, the, the Old Testament is 24 instead of 39, so you could subtract 15 books from the 66. So you got 50, 51 books. So of the regular Bible, there's like 51 books. And each book has their own unique manuscript tradition. And the reality is, you hear people say something like, certain number of manuscripts of the Bible into different languages. And the reality is that it's far less because 
um, it's like, for example, say the, the Torah. So you have the five books of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. If you have one copy of the book of Genesis, one copy of the book of Exodus, one copy of Leviticus, one copy of Numbers, and one copy of De Deuteronomy, all on the same scroll, you'd say that's one copy of the Bible. That's what, or one copy of the Torah, you'd say. But what if one tribe or one group or city had only the book of Genesis, a different city had only the book of Exodus, a different city had only the book of Leviticus, a different city had only the book of Numbers, and another city had only the book of Deuteronomy. Would that be five copies of the Torah or one copy of the Torah? None of the above. Some people would count it as five copies, but the reality is it's one copy of each book for a total of one copy of the Torah. But basically what Christians tend to do is they take those five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, in those separate places, and they count them as five copies of the Bible. Because just one part of the Bible, they call it the Bible. So you have, you basically have every book in the Bible being counted as the Bible itself. So suddenly, let's say, I don't know the exact numbers of manuscripts of the Bible, but let's say you have like um, uh, 50,000 manuscripts of the Bible, let's just say. That's what they claim, let's just say. Uh, well, when you start realizing that each of the books um, are being counted individually as if it was the entire Bible, suddenly the number decreases rapidly and now you might be down to maybe 10,000 or 5,000 copies of the Bible instead of 10,000, which is much less impressive than the 50,000 50, that was originally cited. I say all this because they, uh, people tend to have this mistaken notion of like trying to find divine evidence that, that Christianity or the Bible is true, and they make these type of statistics that seem improbable and seem so unlikely that it must be true. It must be divinely inspired because there'd be no way it could be so, so amazingly preserved or so many people will believe. Um, but when you start looking at other, other, other books, you see a lot of other books are preserved in many copies, hundreds of copies sometimes. Um, and then you have um, religions. Religions are a big one. Like basically, okay, so first of all, Judaism is preserved far less, and yet that was the true religion of the Bible, right? Judaism, or a ancient form of Judaism. And then you have um, other religions like Islam. Islam is almost more populous than Christianity. Um, and it's widespread throughout the world in far many different countries uh, throughout the Middle East and Asia and Africa are the big centers of Islam. Billions of believers. And then you have Hinduism and Buddhism. Those two religions spread like wildfire. wildfire. So the idea of a religion spreading and lots of new believers coming is not particularly indicative of divine origin necessarily, because if that's the case, then we have to conclude, okay, then that must mean Buddhism is a divine origin. Now, actually, you know, I, you could make the argument, maybe, maybe it is, but that's a separate discussion. But um, my point is simply that I don't see anything particularly miraculous about a religion spreading like wildfire or a philosophy. It really, in many ways, just comes down to chance of do their followers decide to uh, preserve the teachings or writings of their forefathers, their founders. You've got Plato, the writings of Plato. Um, the, his followers were devoted to his writings, and that's why his writings were preserved. And of course, Christians converted to Platonism, basically, and, and they preserved Platonism in their rel religious writings. With Islam, war was used to forcibly convert many, many nations. 
And uh, Christianity did something similar with the Crusades and other instances where the Roman Empire basically forced people to become Christians, essentially. So in, in many ways, it's actually not that miraculous that uh, Christianity spread when you start when you start spreading it to the, the, the leaders. Remember, in the ancient times, countries had state religions. So if a, if a, if a, a leader of a country was to convert to a religion, it would be pretty reasonable to suspect that a large number of his people would also convert in the, in the coming century after that. Um, so, so I would say I do believe in the story of Acts of Thomas and the conversion of, of India through Thomas the Apostle, but I don't think it necessarily is any significance of how could it be possible so many converted? They could have all converted even if Thomas was a uh, false apostle. People could have converted um, in, in mass because they were inspired by Thomas's message. So that's the thing about him is that when he was there, he was martyred and also um, they sent every kind of army against those people to kill them. It could be that they fought back. I don't. I just don't know the history that well. But I did put a link on it regarding the Travancore and the place of uh, the Thomasine um, origin is really within Travancore called Kerala, K-E-R-A-L-A. -A. So if anybody wants to look at that, there's a link there. Okay. That was a long question. So uh, yeah. answer to the question. Sorry about that. Oh, wait, hold on one sec. There's a thing here that says, in the neighboring kingdom of, let's see, the kingdom of Travancore, at its zenith, it covered most of central and southern Kerala mm -hmm. with the Tachudaya Kamal's enclave of Aranjalakuda Kudalmanakyam <laughs> temple in the neighboring kingdom of Cochin. I say Cochin. That re this is the reason why I'm like, oh, Co Cochin. Um, there were Cochin Jews, and it was because of the Cochin Jews that the Book of Gad was preserved, actually. Did you say Manichaean? No, uh, Cochin it's called. No, before that, when you were going through that rumble, a different... Um, Words. No, it's it sounds like Manichaean, but it's Manichaeum. It's Kudal Manichaeum. It's yeah. it's a it's some Indian word. We don't speak Indian. Yeah. <laughs> um, or it could also be pronounced apparently Manicam Manicam. Okay. Anyways, uh, I thought that was interesting because the Cochin Jews preserved the Book of Gad, the seer. Yeah. That's good. Who is the father and mother of Paul the Apostle? Don't know. <laughs> I can answer that. From at least from the latest research. The latest research suggests that Paul, one of the many great grandchildren of the Herods, through Herod's sister Salome, that is Herod the Great, through her marriage to Costabarus, an Idumean, that is an Arabian. His father was Antipater II, and his mother was named Cypros. Both of these are Herodian names. Paul's sister was named after her mother. She was Cypros II. She mm -hmm. was married to Helchius, the temper, temple treasurer. You know, there was a whole uh, generation of Helchius that were temple treasures, and she married one of them. It was like a dynasty. And Paul's nephew is known in secular history. His name was Julius or Julius Archelaus, a Herodian name. The boy who warned the Romans that Paul was being murdered, if you can remember that from the end of Acts. You might also have noticed in the Acts how familiar Paul was with Festus and King Agrippa II. Agrippa was his cousin. Agrippa I and Agrippa II were his cousins. 
So we're talking about the the reign over Israel from the Herodians from about 42 or 44, 42 AD and on till that was till their end. So with that knowledge and the mention of Paul and his brother several times in Josephus as a relative of Herod and a troublemaker, we can suddenly put the Apostle Paul in context as to how he ended up in Jerusalem, why he was run out of Damascus, and why the zealots in the temple wanted to kill him. By the way, Paul's nephew was a friend of Josephus, and Josephus mentioned him as the very first one to purchase Josephus' book, The Jewish War. And of course, you go over to Romans chapter 16. This is kind of the, the tell-all here where Paul is sending his greetings to Herodian, his kinsman, and Aristobulus. So uh, Herodian means the littlest Herod. And here we have Paul admitting his Herodian roots by calling Herodian, Herodian and Aristobulus his kinspeople. And also, finally, you remember that Paul said he went off to Damascus for a couple of years, or he went to Arabia for a couple of years? Well, I would guess that he went down there to be with his kinfolk in exile for a few years after his conversion and being kicked out of Damascus by King Aretas. So that's, that's my thought, and it's also the thought of the latest research into Paul. That, to me, is really a revelation. The reason I laughed when you were starting your question is because I, I searched on Google, who is Paul's parents? And the first result brought me to what you were saying. And, it, and what's funny is that it brought me to your answer is that right? as, as the first result. So that That's was what I did answer. Wow, it's the first result? The, uh, the one that I searched. Um, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not always the same for everybody. Google is funny. It, it's based on, you know, it's possible that because I know you, it might make your result higher. Okay. Um, this, uh, this was the only question that I already answered and I forgot that I did. The reason I got it in my inbox is because somebody upvoted it. Hmm. So I, if they upvoted it, that means I had already answered it one time. So I just went through what my answer was. All right, give another question. Believe it or else. Okay. Mm -hmm. How is poverty dealt with in the scripture, Luke 12, 15? I can't tell you off the top of my head what that is. Let's see, Luke 12, 15. Um, King James Version, and he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. So what was the question again? How is poverty dealt with in that passage? Um, no big deal? I'm not clear on the nature of the question. Um, are they saying is it, are they asking if it encourages poverty or? I think what he's looking for is an, is an anti-Christian answer. That's what I feel. How is poverty dealt with in the scripture, Luke 12, 15? It's kind of like he's fishing for, for um, an answer that those in poverty in that particular passage are not even heeded. You think? Possibly. I mean, I do have an interesting answer if I can find it. Okay. Um, it's from the Clementine homilies. We know we love the Clementine homilies, right? Um, 
but I'm gonna look for that. So while I look for that, why don't you share what the next question might be? This comes from Ashwin Krishna. Is anyone still alive from the Ten Commandments? I don't know if we're talking about the movie or the actual Ten Commandments. I think probably. <laughs> As to the movie, I think there's one of those guys are still alive. That was back in the 50s. But that's been a couple of years ago since I looked them up. There was actually two versions of the movie. There was an older version. Okay, so maybe he's talking about the actual Ten Commandments. And I would say... Um, unless he's talking about the Son of God, I would have to say no. I can't imagine anyone still alive from that time. All right, so I found uh, the passage. Um, okay. So um, the scriptures, in my view, teach a very different understanding of, of uh, wealth and, and money that it would be very difficult for most believers of the church and, and, and just everybody in the world to accept. It basically teaches the Essene way of, of uh, sharing all that you have, not really clinging clean to things as your own, not having an overabundance of things. The things that you do have, you share with others, you don't hoard for yourself. So basically, this is from the homilies. This is um, homily, Clement, Clement uh, homilies, homily number 15. And it says, will you be so, I'm going to read that. All right. So will you be so good as to explain this matter also? I remember Clement saying to me that we suffer injuries and afflictions for the forgiveness of our sins. Peter said, this is quite correct, for we who have chosen the future things, insofar as we possess more goods than these, whether they be clothing or food or drink or any other thing, possess sins, because we ought not to have anything, as I explained to you a little ago. To all of us, possessions are sins. The deprivation of these, in whatever way it may take place, is the removal of sins. And our father said, that seems reasonable as you explain that these two, the, these were the two boundary lines of the two kings, and that it was in the power of each to choose whatever he wished of what was under their authority. But why are the afflictions sent, or do we suffer them justly? And Peter said, most justly. For since the boundary line of the saved is, as I said, that no one should possess anything, but since many have possessions, or in other words, sins, for this reason, the exceeding love of God sends afflictions on those who do not act in purity of heart. That on account of their having some measure of the love of God, they might, by temporary inflictions, be saved from eternal punishments. And our father said, how then is this? Do we not see many impious men poor? Then do these belong to the saved on this account? And Peter said, not at all, for that poverty is not acceptable, which longs for what it ought not. So that some are rich as far as their choice goes, though poor in actual wealth, and they are punished because they desire to have more. But one is not unquestionably right just because he happens to be poor. For he can be a beggar as far as actual wealth is concerned, but he may desire and even do what above everything he ought not to do. Thus he may worship idols or be a blasphemer or fornicator, or he may live indiscriminately or perjure himself or lie or live the life of an unbeliever. But our teacher pronounced the faithful poor blessed, and he did so not because they had given anything, for they had nothing but because they were not to be condemned as having done no sin, simply because they gave no alms because they had nothing to give. And our father said, in good truth, all seems to go right as far as the subject of discussion is concerned. Wherefore, I have resolved to listen to the whole of your argument in regular order. And it keeps going after that. So homilies is more controversial than the recognitions which Jackson has published before. 
Um, can you can you put that summarize that you know in, in both of those books the uh, the verbiage is so long and confusing. Can you summarize what you just said and say so it? the summary is basically that Peter says that if you possess anything you uh, you are sinning because possessions are sins and um, that um, if we have possessions, God sends afflictions to punish us because of our possessions. And then his father asks, well, so are you saying that poor people are righteous? And then Peter explains, no, poor people aren't necessarily righteous. Some poor people are wicked as well, but the only people that are righteous are poor people. And that uh, this is the command we are given to be, you have to be righteous and you also have to be poor, which you know is where the Ebionite name comes from. Ebionites were the yeah. poor. And the Dead Sea Scrolls speaks about the poor ones in a positive light. So here's how I understand this. Um, well, first of all, this is a controversial teaching that was removed from, I think the recognitions version doesn't really have this as clearly, but you see this in the New Testament in certain places. Like um, Gospel of Luke says, blessed are the poor well, guess what? Gospel of Matthew didn't like that. The, the scribes of Gospel of Matthew, they didn't like that. So they changed it. They made it say, poor in spirit. But the fact is, it's pretty clear by context of Scripture, of what the Messiah said elsewhere, that the Messiah really meant, blessed are the poor, not poor in spirit, the poor, for they shall be made rich. But woe to those who are rich, for they shall be deprived, um, it says in the uh, Gospel of Luke. So then there's another thing where the Gospel of Matthew has the man who says, what must I do to be saved? I've done the Ten Commandments. That, and then the Messiah says, go sell what you have, and then you will be perfect. Gospel of Luke, on the other hand, says, sell all that you have doesn't say sell what you have, but it says all that you have. Because some people might look at Matthew and say, oh, well, it just says sell what you have. Not a big deal. But Luke says sell all that you have, implying that you are to give away everything. And then there's another passage in the Gospels, which, which the, Peter and the other apostles say, well, you told, you said that the way to be saved is we get to give away everything. We've given away everything. So are we saved? That's basically what the apostles said. Um, so how do we reconcile all this with a something, a system that's not burdensome or unfair and which reconciles with scripture? Because scripture seems to endorse being rich, right? Like Abraham was rich, David was rich, Solomon was rich. So how? How do we reconcile this? A few things. First of all, Abraham was rich, right? But what did he do with his riches? He literally had to feed an entire nation practically. So you see, Abraham had his all his family relatives, but he also had all his servants, his animals. When you start doing the math of how much money he would have needed in, in today's money, he Abraham would, would have needed to have been making well over a million dollars every year to provide food for everybody. If Here's how I come to this figure. Um, Abraham had 300 servants come with him, 318 to be exact, to rescue Lot, right? That's not counting women and children. So if you count women and children and everybody else, Abraham had at least a thousand people with him, a thousand people. Now, according to, you know, modern times, pretty much um, you will spend at least a thousand dollars on food per person, per adult person. So if you have a thousand people with Abraham, Abraham has to feed each person a thousand dollars worth of food. That's a million dollars for one year's worth of food. That's not even counting the animals. He has to take care of all their animals, and he has all those. Pro he has a, a lot of property, but what is he doing with that property? He's not keeping the property for himself. He's giving it so that he he makes it so that each of his servants have their own tents to live in. He's giving tents to everybody of his people. He's giving food to all his people. He's truly sharing everything he has and not keeping it for himself. So Abraham actually is not really rich because he's sharing it with everybody. So 
you're only rich if you, if you have possessions. But if you're giving it all away to other people, you're sharing it with people, you're not possessing it. Another thing to keep in mind. So who owns everything on the earth? Who owns all the, the creation? God owns everything. Elohim owns everything. So when we, have, when, he, when we have land, when we have anything, the reality is we are being allowed to use it by our creator. It's not ours. We're being given permission to use something that does not belong to us, but belongs to the creator. The creator has given it for all benefit of the benefit of everybody, but we have been allowed to use it for ourselves. But so where it comes to possessions or sins would be, I believe private property is a sin. I, I'm against private property in my beliefs. So I believe in something called communal property, which the Dead Sea Scrolls speaks on and the New Testament speaks on in the book of Acts. Communal property is basically you take all your property, you, sh you basically hand it over to the community. Um, you either sell, up, sell what you have and hand it over, or you literally give what you have. Like let's say you have a couch, you'll give your couch to the community. If you have a car, you'll give your car to the community. And then what happens is it then becomes redistributed where essentially, let's say you contribute a million dollars worth to the community. Well, because you committed a million dollars, you're going to get credit to you from the community where you basically have a million dollars worth of credit. And so, um, and then let's say the car you gave to the community, you have 49% ownership of that car everybody else has like no everybody else has zero percent of the car you have 49 percent. so who has the 51 percent? the community as a whole so you're basically co-owning like imagine you are you have a marriage husband and wife you guys both co-own a house or you have a joint bank account if it's joint that means you share it together and one doesn't own it over the other, but you co-own it. In the same way, private property does not exist in the true uh, society of scripture. What exists instead is communal property where you, where you share it with everybody, but you have, a, you have a priority over each individual person to that property. But the community as a whole has priority over your 49 percent um in that type of way it preserves what scripture says about property everybody gets property but not possessions so everybody has property but not possessions so you can have something but it does it's not your possession because it doesn't belong to you it belongs to the community first but you're being allowed to use it as your property so that's a distinction that i believe scripture makes so you can have property, but not possessions, so long as the property is communal property. Um, and so that's the poverty that I believe scripture teaches us to follow. And how do we apply this? In today, when we, when we don't have a community right now, how do we apply it? Well, anything you have, share it with somebody. If you have a car and someone needs a ride, give them a ride. If it's your friend or a coworker, like if you work a job, give your coworker a ride if they need help. Um, if you just know people, like if you, if you go to a church and someone needs a ride, give them a ride. Um, if someone needs, if someone's hungry and needs to eat, share your food with them. You know, scripture talks about if you turn away someone in need, if someone needs clothes and you don't clothe them, you will, you be condemned for that. If you don't feed them when they're hungry, you'll be condemned. If you don't give them water when they're thirsty, you'll be condemned. So we got to share everything we have. And when we do that, by sharing, we are basically telling people, this is not mine. I'm sharing it with you guys. So it's ours. When, when you share it with someone else, it, be, it becomes everybody's. That's my take on it. Long answer to the question, but it's a deep subject in my opinion. All that you have shared, I would agree with, with one exception. I believe when we read about that, we can also look at the Didache, 
and at Luke, the end of chapter two, and at the end of chapter four, I'm talking about the Acts, and uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Yahad rule, the, the community is the community of believers. Right. The community of believers, rather than just any Tom, Dick, or Harry that comes to your door, because uh, I'll give you an example. I, I practice this, and only I can tell you that I do. Even in this house, I have two missionaries living in here with me. And right now, they're my community. And we share everything alike. We don't have any property together. Uh, what, when somebody comes to my place and wants a place to stay and they're a believer, they can come in and stay, and they can take anything out that they want. However, I've had some people that have taken advantage of that and stolen. And I'm, I'm thinking about Ananias and Sapphira in the Acts, what happens to them for doing that, or not being discerning about who you let into your community. If, if they're malevolent, they could come in and, and kill you. And I've had plenty of them that Yahweh gave me discernment to say no to. So, and some that I said yes to that I shouldn't have. In the Didache, it talks about people coming in. One of the chief lessons of both the uh, Hebrew scriptures and the Didache is hospitality. And so in the Didache, it talks about if they, if an evangelist or a brother or sister comes, they can stay two days. I think it's two days. If they want to stay three, they can do that too, if their decision is to stay in the community and get a job and work. And so you are bidden as a believer and having uh, decided that the person that you are letting into the community is a believer, you're to help them find work. And again, this is something else that has come to pass here in my house in the last five years, uh, numerous times. And so that is the real kind of hospitality. You take in, in Matthew chapters 9 and 10, these disciples going out, and it says, don't even take any shoes with you. And would you think they're going to strangers in these other towns to evangelize? Of course not. They're going to brothers that, all, brothers and sisters that also adhere to the Essene way, uh, that are knowledgeable about that, that are in the community of faith, but live in other places. You're not to bother them about anything, but give them a hand in getting either a place to stay or even established there. So I, I just can't think that, that the disciples are going out without even sandals in one version, knocking on doors and saying, will you let me in? It just can't happen unless the people there are relatives or parts of the extended community. That's they, go, they go door to door and say, have you heard the good news? They do? And some Mormons, I think. That's what, that's what the apostles did, right? I don't know. <laughs> Could be. Um, but I think they had a connections, just like we do, maybe not so extensive. You know, I have a network. I keep a network of 5,000 people here. And uh, it's a network that if somebody needs help and you're living in uh, Microville, Texas, and they get a hold of me, I'm going to try to find a believer down there that can help them. It is a connection of religious believers that also adhere to the Essene or the Dake way of helping, uh, of hospitality. What we see in scripture seems to be of a public teaching. Um, typically, like in the book of Acts, you see people going to the synagogues. The Gospels, the Messiah goes into the synagogues and then the streets and, and uh, proclaims teachings for the public to see. And then people who are receptive to it 
will come yeah. and ask for more and they and they will then they will go into private quarters and they will talk exactly we don't really see evidence of them going to random doors door to door and saying hey uh guess what uh jesus is god or anything crazy like that so right um i believe that too thank you i hope you all will take that lesson to heart because it's it served me well i know it's served a lot of other people well and certainly at the times i've done touring to meet people which i can't seem to do anymore due to my health uh, these are the people i call on and without without an exception they let me into their house and let me stay really as long as i want now, here's something I want to say, though. Um, sure. So I agree with you on the one hand, but there is some type of disagreement I have okay. in an absolute adherence to it in the sense of, so I do believe in the truest sense of community and communism that it's only for believers. But I also believe in the principle applied to a broader spectrum. Oh, yeah. I know what like, you mean. Like your neighbor. Well, okay, so for example, um, in the book of Genesis, Joseph actually gets control of practically everything, and he um, he basically buys everybody's land and buys all their property and everything, and then when they run out of money, like, he basically takes everything from them and then redistributes it to them. And th these are all the Gentile nations around the, around the region of Egypt that he completely overtakes uh, control over all their possessions and everything. And and all their food and all their money and everything. So um, animals. But basically the other thing is I've struggled with this because the problem is if you say only share with believers then what happens to people who are unsaved or people who are not really true believers, but they're like, kind of like people who call themselves Christians, but don't really walk the walk. All yeah. right. Well, I, in my own experience, I can't trust those people as far as I can throw them because I have been screwed so many times by letting people who said they were Christians in or letting them borrow something that's in the community and you know all this equipment that i've bought and other people have bought for the ahad nobody owns it anybody can use it anytime they want to um, but as far as common decency of course we want to be uh, we want to uh, practice common decency even to the lowest sinner i just mean for example when scripture speaks of uh the gospels speak of um, when you see someone poor, you know, hungry, uh, thirsty, or naked, that you, um, if you don't do, if you don't do it unto them, you won't be won't doing do. it unto him. Yes. So my my concern is that if someone is unsaved, like let, let's say we come across an unbeliever who is in that situation, who has nothing to eat, who has nothing to wear, and we say, oh, he's not a believer we walk away. You can compare that to the Samaritan story, the, um, the Good Samaritan thing, where we're told basically the Samaritan, even though he considered the Jew to be evil and, you know, an unbeliever of the true religion, practically, essentially, he decided to help the Jew out of the com common good of, of, of mm -hmm. decency. And he even, he paid for the inn. He, he took care of everything. So the way I see it is that this is a principle that can also be applied to unbelievers in the sense of things that you don't, like, I, I've read something in scripture that's, or in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that seems to say that there's certain possessions which other communities, and then there's other things which the community allows you to share with outsiders. So... There's possessions which you're only to share with fellow people in your community. And then there's possessions which, communal possessions that is, which you may share, you're given permission to share with other people. And I believe those things would be like food for other people. You can get permission. Okay, this person is poor. 
we're going to give some of the communities food to these people. We're going to clothe these people. We have we have extra clothing, and it's really cold outside. Let's give some clothing to the poor. And there's you know so many places in the world that need water. So I think mm -hmm. a, a righteous community would would save up funds, save up money, and then buy uh, water for for places that need water. And um, there, I believe that many things people we might call unbelievers may not actually be unbelievers in the truest sense, and they might actually be believers in a alternate sense of. I truly believe that other religions, uh, other religions have uh, the truth. It may be that Yahshua sends these people to you, and uh, you are to use discernment about that. That's why you're given that. How many, let me, uh, let me pose a question to the people who listen to this on YouTube or on a podcast. And that question is, how many times have you paid some poor people's electric bill? How many times have you shared your feast with someone that's hungry, like your Thanksgiving? How many times have you actually visited someone in prison? It's not too easy to do, but you can. And there are people there that really need visiting, even greater than that. How many times have you sashayed through a nursing home and gave good news to these people who are, who are so uh, bound and decrepit that they can do absolutely nothing but sit in a chair all day after being given drugs to keep them from being too active. That's part of what we are tasked to do with the good news and the Great Commission. I'm asking that online to whoever happens to hear this and maybe we'll get some comments on this. Every day, I do it every day. Uh, I, I help everybody. Good. No, I don't actually. But well, um, someday um, you might see a beggar come up, come up to your place wherever that is, and say, "Don't you remember me, brother Honia? Don't you remember me? I'm your old sidekick. When we used to do Q and A." <laughs> and, I, and I'll say, "I'll say, I never knew you. Go away from me, <laughs> you who practice lawlessness." Okay. Um, uh, let's see. What was I going to say though? Uh, oh yeah, there is a passage in the gospel which seems to say we should we should do stuff with random strangers. There's the one thing that sa which says um, the Messiah is going. You know, he invites people to his wedding, and, and no one of his friends shows up. So he says, "Okay, I'm just going to invite random strangers to my wedding, and and uh, and see if they show up." So he invites random strangers, and they come. Just kind of funny. Okay. That's good. So I think I think it's uh, you know what Jackson said is really true, and we need it. Kind of is humbling because if you if you apply it to yourself, I mean I apply it, I'm applying it to myself, and I certainly don't visit people in prison. Although right now with COVID, that's kind of almost impossible. But in a in a normal world scenario where there's no COVID, um, I don't do a lot of those things i'm trying to do my part and help people I, I do i do help people on a regular basis but only a few people well just uh, remember yashua took his disciples and trained them how to do those things for three years and if you go to seminary or something like that you've got to do them in order to pass you've got to be taught how to do that you wouldn't expect somebody that is grown up in a secular world of possessions to just do that naturally usually some people would but it's, it's something you have to train for. It's something that the Holy Spirit has to get you ready for if you will simply pray for more opportunities. Hey, you'll get them. It's also something that's hard to apply on a universal basis because of um, there's always someone in jail. There's always, um, there's always people to feed and everything. So when it comes down to the when it comes down to the statement of what Yeshua said and what he meant in terms of you will be condemned if you don't help these people, 
in some ways, on an absolute basis, I think it does apply to fellow believers because you, your fellow believers are, are, are in uh, prison and you, and you are to reach out to your, your fellow family. Um, so like in an absolute sense, I think it applies to believers. But in a general sense, I think it can also apply to non-believers um, on a case-by-case -case basis, based on the leading, how you feel led. Um, but that could just be a justification, and maybe we should be really doing much more than we currently do, like, you know, like visiting prisons. I'd be afraid to visit prisons because, of you know, a lot of people are yeah uh r rough rough edged people so but in that day we're talking about people that were hauled in for their religious beliefs right they might not be malevolent people at all they just were hauled in there to rot away in a dungeon someplace until they died just because of what they might believe or because of their testimony you ready for another question Lee, yeah, let's see what time we've got. 10, 12. So we have we got a little more questions. time. Yeah. Okay. Let's get Make back. it really good one. Well. These are all just a little bit silly. Uh, what's, what's a silly one? Well, they, come, they come from people that really don't know much about the Bible at all. All right. Well, you, you may have answered this before, right, in this last Gergustium. And that is from Matthew 5. 43b, what does neighbor mean in the Good Samaritan parable, and why is the word neighbor used in the Bible? Did we cover that one before? I don't think so. Um, so there's neighbor and there's brother. Who's my neighbor? And, mm -hmm. the, and then the Samaritan parable. That's so good. You can make that difference there, neighbor and brother. Yeah, so who, love your neighbor. Uh, I think that's important. I think that, that is very true to apply to, who does this apply to? Who are we supposed to feed? Who are we supposed to clothe? Who are we supposed to visit in prison? Our neighbors, people who are in our community, our context. We're not expected to visit people in other countries in, in prison. You know, you've got North Korean prisoners, you've got Chinese prisoners, Israel prisoners, um, prisoners all over the world. That's impossible to visit them, and it's not practical. But people in our community, maybe we should be visiting them. So, like, let's say I live in Schenectady. So maybe I should be going to Schenectady prisons and visiting people in my community, my, my neighbors. Um, if, if there's poor people in my city, I should be trying to help those people. Where, where you see there's there's like there's circles there's circles of um of importance i i believe there's first of all there's you you're the most important i know that sounds horrible but i believe that we are supposed to take care of ourselves first above everybody else um i could be wrong on that but that's my personal belief um and then there's your family take care of your family next that's the next circle then it becomes a community, like a religious community, like, you know, fellow believers of your group. Then I would say it comes to, well, part of that, I guess, is friends as well. If you have really good friends, that counts as community in that sense. But then beyond that comes um, where, where you live, the city where you live. Then the next circle is um, your county. Then the next circle is the state. Next circle is the country. Next circle, I guess there's no other circle. It's just the whole world, you know. So basically, you have different priorities. And the command to clothe, feed, and all that stuff, I think visit people in prison, I think it's very much community-based, people in your general community. You cannot be expected to travel all over the world and visit every prison cell. That's illogical. Um, but you definitely can focus on 
where you live and you should. Um, and then, uh, let's see, Tower Time says like putting on the oxygen mask on a plane, putting on yours before helping your children or others, is that more like what you're saying? Um, I would say not necessarily because in that sense, they're telling you, yes, you may want to save these people's lives, but you got to save your life first because if you don't, you might not be, they're basically giving you advice to, to say, if you focus on trying to save someone else's life, you might lose consciousness and then you can't save their life or yours. So both of you are, are going to die. So it's more practical in that sense, but I'm not really saying that. I actually say I'm not like, like, for example, it's illogical. Well, Paul actually said this. He said, Paul said, if possible, he would basically go to hell in the place of someone else. To me, that's actually illogical and it would not be righteous at all to make someone else go to hell in someone else's place. So if you have a choice right now, now this is a weird, weird hypothetical, okay? But if you have a choice and God says to you, okay, two two levers first lever you will enter eternal life but everybody else will go to to eternal torment or you pick this lever and everybody else will be will go to eternal life but you will go to eternal torment i believe the correct choice is picking the one where you go to eternal life why because that the very definition of what is moral, I believe, is about yourself. Um, so it's, it's something becomes immoral if it harms yourself in a, in a spiritual sense. So the very fact that if you personally condemn yourself to torment, that is immoral. That is wrong. It is wrong to, to destroy yourself. So you have a duty to save yourself above all others in the sense of eternal life, not in the sense of physical life. So if you have physical life, you know, and let's say you're saved already, it's okay if you sacrifice your life to save another. That is fine. But you need to, you have that duty to save your life, eternal life, over the eternal lives of others in my belief. I don't know if that's 100% true. I'm just sharing my perspective. People are free to disagree on that. Um, I would say, I would say family comes first before friends, in my opinion, in the in the hierarchy. Uh, I personally believe that we have a greater duty to family than friends. You know, honor your father and mother. If your brother dies, you have to marry their. Uh, their widow uh, if they don't have children there's inheritance rights for family all that is very much a very highly important stuff but they you don't have that for friends it's not the same thing like if you lose a friend there's not a death penalty for friends being lost but if you if you like if, if you betray your friend that's not a um it's not a death penalty but if you betray your wife or your parents that is a death penalty, like, you know, adultery, death penalty. Um, if you uh, dishonor your parents, death penalty. So for my, it doesn't say it's death penalty unless you don't really, unless you're not really close to your parents. The implication is your family is your family, no matter how you feel about them. So you have to respect your family. And if you don't respect your family, that's a serious, very serious sin. Whereas your friends, it's serious, but not nearly as serious as disrespecting your family. Um, that's, that's my, again, that's my per perspective on it. But those are the, you know, there's circles, like I said, uh, family, friends, acquaintances, uh, like work, you know, coworkers, you've got neighbors, enemies are the farthest down your line. Yeah, uh, this, this friend, our frame plan is something that I learned while in the church as far as the 
uh, the circle of people outside of you that we need to consider for evangelism? Friends, relatives, acquaintances, neighbors, and I added enemies onto that and made it fray. And I wish I could think of something that worked a little better than that, but that's how I always remembered it, the frame plan or the fan plan to see our, our, how our benevolence is to be distributed among those who we know of. So that's why I put that on the chat. You ready for one? Yeah. Time we have. We've got time for another one. Yeah. Yeah, you're doing great tonight. I always do great. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, those with pride may fall. Okay. I have one picked out here, and I probably lost it. Hmm. <laughs> oh, is the Old Testament? No, 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 here it is. I'm sorry. I, I put this in a text here, so I wouldn't forget it. What is this passage talking about? Matthew eleven twenty five. At that time... Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him really puts the onus on the sun, doesn't it? Yeah. Do you have any, have any uh, thing to say on that? I mean, it's lengthy. Um, well, what do you have to say on it? What's the passage again? You always put me in. Um, because I want you to share, too. I talk a lot. Well, we both do. Yeah, but I talk more. So I'm, I'm trying to get you to talk, too. So well, I, I see that this, this first part is a prayer. And I use it a lot of the times. I, I, I use it a lot on the Shabbat meeting. I thank you, Father, Master of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise. Because that is absolutely true. So many people misunderstand the teachings of Yahshua in the New Testament because they take someone else's word for it primarily. And this was the will of the Father. Now, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. I have no question about that. It's perfectly straightforward. It's perfectly straightforward. The Son's the revelator. We can't know the Father in the intimate way that he did because we have absolutely no ability to understand anything that surpasses three dimensions. We don't have the, the tools besides sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, and maybe that sixth sense to know anything about a being such as the Father. You know, we all have this kind of idol in our minds as to who the Father is. Some that I've talked to have talked about a man sitting on a throne in the sky with a big long beard, and a lot of art depicts the Father that way in uh, an anthropomorphic kind of disguise and to tell you the truth that's just about all that we can do is look for some model of someone whom we call the father or in the Dead Sea Scrolls the Lord of Spirits what else can we imagine except something that looks like us they couldn't even look at his rear end the Israelites couldn't even look at his rear end that they were scared. So the only person we can really relate to that 
is close to divinity is still the son who I believe is alive and always has been. I can't imagine these messianics that are giving up on the Messiah. I can't understand that. Don't they know him? Haven't they developed a relationship with Yahshua over the course of their years? Have they not had intimate discussion with the Holy Spirit, who's the Spirit of the Son and the Father, in all their lifetime to just, to just uh, 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 abolish it from their lives? I, somebody I know really well, I uh, spoke to in the last couple of weeks, has given up on the Son and has gone for some reason to, to Orthodox Judaism, which is is full as ridiculous, uh, extraneous things as Christianity is. How can you just give up on Yahshua? Hasn't he made an impression in you? Isn't his Holy Spirit around you? Haven't you been baptized in that spirit? Isn't that spirit available to you if you want to get out of a mess or learn something? I can't, I can't even, uh, not even imagine it in my own life. Of course, my life has been a little different than most people's. Well, there's think? many reasons why people reject, uh, in my view. I, I think, uh, I actually understand, well, I understand it in many ways. I well, think. once they've known or, or had this intimate relationship, wouldn't you call such that give up on that relationship as in some respect antichrist yeah but i would say i'm not one of these people to say that people can't like you know some people say well if they if they walk away then that means they never were true believers to begin with i'm not that type of person but yeah. what i would say is that i don't think he really has god really has a relationship with most people i think if people think they have a relationship with him and he doesn't you know scripture talks talks about go away, I never knew you. Um, mm -hmm. I think many people believe God speaks to them when he doesn't. And um, those are the type of people who might walk away eventually, but they may have, they may have had, a, had a true faith at one time, but they weren't in true communion with God. They didn't walk with God. You know, it's Enoch and Noah, they walked yeah. with, that, with Elohim. I think most people don't actually walk with Elohim. They have, they may have faith, you know, I would even say for myself, you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't say that I walk, walk implies like a really, a really uh, good uh, faith. I um, feel like I do, because I guess because I was so young when the whole revelation begins. I mean, it's not like I have to be in constant prayer or anything like that. It's just like, everything I think and do is infiltrated with what I feel is the, the spirit. Now, I can understand walking with the spirit, but I can't understand, I can also understand why that is so hard for most people to achieve. That's why I say my life has been a lot different than most other people. That's all I've really ever looked forward to. That's why so, I'm such a poor old man now. So I did want to say um, the passage. Oh, interesting that it's right before the parable of the Good Samaritan. But the one you're talking about, I thank you, Father. Mm -hmm. um, see, there's many things that in the New Testament that I struggle with. And probably the biggest thing I struggle with is um, the Messiah talking about himself in the third person. To me, that's a big issue. Um, so you have like right here, it's... Uh, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight, all things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and to whom the Son wills to reveal. So there's two possible ways to understand this. Either for some, no, three possible ways. For some strange reason, the Messiah just starts deciding, you know what, I'm just going to talk randomly about myself in the third person and say, I'm, the, right. son, I'm the son. Um, it, or um, he originally was, would, did not say the son, and he was like said, 
uh, no one who knows who I am except the Father, and who the Father is except me, and who and the one to whom I have willed to reveal. But the the other possibility is that is that uh, he was actually talking about fathers and sons, and he was saying, "All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who a son is except the Father." and who a father is except the son, and to whom the son wills to reveal. Um, it's possible that's what he said. I don't know for sure, but um, mm -hmm. we're pretty close to the end here. Yes, so, we are. Yes, we uh, One final thing to say on the subject uh, of, the, of I thank you, Father. It sounds like Messiah is basically saying, thank you, Father, that these people don't know the truth. So why would he say that? I think that some people don't deserve the truth, and some people are so evil that they... They would um, never heed it even if they knew it fully. That's true, and they, and they would uh, be even more evil. So, Yeah, I think that's right. All right, we end up with a, a nice uh, conversation about what we both believe. Let's see if there's anything left here on the chat. Jackson, what, what you what you said today is not what the Bible says. That's that's false. Okay. Well, look, <laughs> I was going to mention that a, a lot of people send have sent me in the past all kinds of rebukes and insults, and still happening even this week because I don't believe like they do about certain things. I don't believe the way the status quo does. I don't believe like Messianics do. I don't believe the Bible is this or that. And they send me insults and call me all kinds of things, including Antichrist. So um, that's just simply not true. Um, we, I, I, am, I do we, believe. I just don't believe in the status quo and the stuff that the world tells us about certain things that are biblical. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Tower Time asked, um, it, it's something we actually talked about in one of our earlier ones. I don't remember which video it is, but we've done, we've yeah. been doing a series every week. And in one of the earlier ones, it was one of the earliest ones we did, we actually touched upon uh, speaking in tongues. Yes. And we, we shared our view on that. So that's one of the earlier ones. And we as far as Isaiah 14, 6, keep those two for next week. Because I want to say something about both of these. Okay, um, yeah, we can and, talk about those. And subjects. the Lucifer business, okay? Thank you very much. Don't forget those two. Let's bring them up. First. Jackson is Lucifer, so. Yeah, and you're the Antichrist. He's, a, he's, so he's a, light, a light bearer. Jackson, you're a light bearer. Yes, okay. that's right. We'll say, we may find out that the word Lucifer is not so bad after all. Since, <laughs> of course, it's not really in the Bible anyplace. Peace, love. And dog.